DCT Audio, the art of good listening. In the December of 2016, I conducted my very first podcast with the then Deputy Chief Constable of Lancashire Constabulary, Andy Rhodes. I was nervous for several reasons. My first being the first attempt at podcasting, sitting down with the big boss and thinking this just can't be an interview full of deference and neutral questions. It had to be probing. And in fact, it became one of the most listened to interviews even today. Since that interview was promoted to Chief Constable, uh, in spite of our interview... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and retired from the police service in 2021. He was the National Police Lead for Wellbeing and is still heavily involved in Oscar Kilo, the National Police Wellbeing Service. And you're a very welcome return guest. I always feel that chief constables are a little bit like school teachers and uh, should always be addressed as, as Mr or Mrs. So I do wholly forgive the familiarity. As I said earlier, the podcast in 2016 was my most listened to. And I thought it would be nice to revisit parts of that interview to see how prophetic or wider the mark you were. So welcome. Thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks for hosting me. Really nice to be back. Cast your mind back, and I'll remind you now, to 2016. Yep. And uh, I'm just going to play a little clip to you. The job of a leader is that you're basically, you're passing through your organisation at a point in its history. So your job is to do your bit for the future, is my view. Not like a relay on it. It is, that's right. Uh, well, we're both handed that baton on. Um, how do you feel? Well, I'm really enjoying being outside of the job, Dave, because I still have the privilege of being connected to it with all the Oscar Kilo stuff. But in the area where we both share a passion around workforce, mental health and well being. Mm. So it is nice to be doing that and looking back on it and thinking, gosh, 2016, things we talked about then, there's so much water gone to the bridge since then. And I think that point about you passing through as a leader, you know, I think there's a, there's a real lesson there to be learned around this subject matter is so important, it can't be left to a particular leader's penchant or difference of opinion or mm. potential passion or otherwise for the subject it's such a big issue for every organisation now that you've got to have a sustainable way of delivering this to mm. an organisation, you know, which is what uh, I think we're trying to do in Oscar Kilo is generate that sort of core consistency, you know, rather than it being ebbing and flowing with people's personalities. Well, it's interesting that uh, speaking with a colonel in the army a year or two ago on leadership, and, and he was saying as he rose through the ranks and he was a battalion commander now, so I think he had about 700 people under his command, his leadership was more symbolic with the people mm. at the bottom because mm. they didn't see him very often. Yeah. And he always had to be on top of his game, perhaps not so much with his people that he worked with, his captains and his majors, but certainly the privates and, and the mm. corporals, mm. you know. He couldn't afford to have a bad day with them. Very good point. That's, you, you've almost... I was exactly thinking that then. I think the starting point is you've got to recognise and understand how they feel about leadership and... Whether they're interested or not, whether this is a big event for them or not, the time you see them, it is a key point in time for them. And they read a lot into how you behave and what you say. And if you're not feeling great or you're a bit stressed out or you're a bit annoyed about something, that's all they'll hear. And they'll interpret it in the way they see fit. Well, uh, as you say, a lot of water has gone under the bridge since 2016 for both of us, I guess. We're both now retired. Thinking over that time now, since we last spoke, what have been your highs and lows during your tenure as Chief Constable? Well, I think definitely in anybody's career, if you just said to me in 1991, when I was walking the beat in Blackpool, after being a, a self-employed person coming into the job, that you'd have ended up in your own force as well, mm. being a Chief. I'd never believed it. So that obviously is a huge high point. I think the other thing for me is... You know, the other passion in my life has been moving the culture, improving the offer around workplace mental health and well-being. And looking back at some of those ups and downs that we've had, either operationally or organisationally, I can't hardly think, Dave, in 30 years of service, something about you, where we've ever felt as though we've had time on the ball. Do you know, like a really good elite sports team, they're effortless, isn't it? I can't ever remember from the minute I joined the job to the minute I left, ever feeling as though the pressure was off, that we had enough people to do exactly what we wanted all the time. And I just think people now talk about today and how pressurised it is. Yes. And I sort of think there's a lots of different challenges. It's far more complicated than it used to be. 
And that brings inherent problems and challenges at every level yes. of, of policing, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Well, I was telling you earlier, I was having a few technical issues this morning with the, the equipment and, and it made me realise that I don't react too well to stress these days. <laughs> um, so how is retirement for you and um, what are you doing professionally at the moment? Well, I'm, I'm doing um, a couple of days a week with Oscar Kilo, which is great. got three grandchildren. Um, wow. My wife, who, as you know, is a psychotherapist, she does her work and I do some work either with her or whatever. So it's all in the mental health and well-being now that I do. And I quite enjoy working quite a lot. Some people might say, oh, hold on a minute. You know, you've done this, you've done that. But I retired at 55, which I think is still young. Mm. Um, yeah, snap. Um, I've got, you know, I'm played with an active mind, Dave. Snap. It's very restless like you. And so, you know, I need stuff to occupy my mind mm. and I'm, lucky enough to be able to occupy my mind with stuff that i enjoy with people i enjoy working with mm. which is because i get to meet some fascinating people and hear about some fascinating stories in this world that mm. that we work in it's mm. great isn't it mm. so i'm enjoying that and uh, but i'm enjoying also not i don't know about you dave i'm enjoying every morning not the first thing i read is the overnight log and you know you sort of like you've just talked about something's made you stressed here today that's a bit like yeah. not not a major issue no no well you normalize certain levels of stress and yeah. you normalize getting up every morning looking at all this stuff that's happened every night and that's your start today we did talk about that last time how we normalize things i i think i've got to go i'm going to change my view on that slightly and say i put up with it yes yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. now I'm retired, I don't have to put, don't up, have with to put up with it. So yeah. when it does happen to me, it's like... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've less... Yeah, that's right. And you don't have to put up with it, do you? Because you're not forced into an environment where it's there all the time, necessarily, yes. at that level. But I do think that's an unusual thing that people just sort of do. And I look back on it, Dave, and I think, why did I send that daily log to so many people? Most of them didn't even need to read it. It's just starting your day off on the worst possible footing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's like reading the newspapers. <laughs> well, this is it. Well, studies have been done saying study on students who didn't watch the news for X amount of time are far happier and more positive and psychological health than people who did. There's very rarely any good news, is there? To be honest, you know, uh, out there. And when you work in an environment where what you see and do every day is a snapshot of society that is sometimes very sad, very depressing, very tragic, even though in the, whole, uh, the the totality of the world, that is a very small part of what goes on. For you, it becomes 90% of what goes on. I don't know about you, but you know, we talk about hypervigilance. I've started to see the world in a bit of a nicer place two years out, and I'm not as hypervigilant as I used to be. I don't, I don't think it'll ever leave me, but, you know, thinking the best of people, um, thinking actually most people in the world get out of bed every morning, just go to work and do a decent job. Yeah. They're not all bad people. It's very true, that hypervigilance. I mean, you know, I, I took six months off work. For, well, I suppose a breakdown, there's no other way you can dress it up. But that very thing, hypervigilance, it wasn't even something I was aware of until it was taken away from me. And for me, it was waiting for the phone call on, on the Friday mm -hmm. after doing mm -hmm. social services mm -hmm. or when I was on traffic, it was it wasn't a question of if, it was just a question of when. When, when that shout will come in for a fatal. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I was constantly on waiting. edge, just yeah. waiting for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I never even considered that. But you see, I, this is my sort of take on it, Dave. We actually reward that because it catches baddies as well. Yeah, you know, if I'm driving down the street now and I go, Oh, that's out of place. Yeah. That you know what I mean? And yeah, that, yeah. that's a good thing to have because it potentially could save lives. Yes. But also, if it becomes your predominant and pejorative way of thinking, you know, we know that that's not going to be great for your mental health. No. And it's certainly not easy to live with somebody like that if you're not living and working in the same environment. You're right. These skills that we learned in the police, I find now in retirement that I'm kind of reluctant to give them up. Mm -hmm. Because I don't certainly don't need them, mm. but it's um, it's kind of tied in with your identity, isn't it? And mm. um, you know, if I give these skills up now, who, who am I? You know, um, do I have any worth left? Am I important anymore? And it's quite interesting retirement. It's, it, it's good, but it, it also presents you with a few things that you wouldn't have even considered. Well, we'll probably touch later, Dave, on very early days with the police government which mm. we've been doing a lot of work to support because there's a big piece of work about levers and how we support people to transition out 
at whatever service level, whatever role mm. we've been in, because we don't really do that in policing consistently well. We've been working with the armed forces for some time now to learn from what they do. It'd be interesting to touch on that because one of the gaps is psychological preparation as well as skills and all this sort of yeah. stuff because it is for a lot of people like walking off one planet onto another. I think it's it's just been part of an institution, isn't it? And I don't think it's anything personal from your colleagues. And uh, I've got a funny story. I'll tell you who it is afterwards. But it was, it was a, a, a DI, detective inspector, who retired, a well-liked DI, yeah. well-known, much loved. And um, he was retiring from Blackpool. And as you know, there's two sets of doors, isn't there, in the main entrance. So he got through the first set of doors. The doors closed behind him. He turned around to wave and everybody had gone. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what? That, that is back to your original point, passing through. And just... You see, this is one of the strengths of policing, is that it's like a machine that just keeps moving forward day after day. But once you step off it, it keeps moving forward. And it's like, right, okay, we've all got our own things to think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've now stepped off and you've stepped on. And I think that's quite a humbling thing. But it's something that we should be talking about to people so that it doesn't come as a big shock. Okay, well, we talked about leadership. Let's listen to the next clip. I do genuinely have a view that it's not about the hero leader anymore. Uh, I think in some aspects of particularly our culture, the big operational leader is seen as the be all and end all of leadership. And it is a role, obviously it's clearly a role for us, particularly if there's a crisis happening, that we need people to step up to that very directive leadership style that's around command and control. But more often than not now, particularly when you're trying to get the best out of people, deliver change, it's about you as a person, how you treat other people, how you build trust with them, mm. and those are very personal aspects of leadership. So that was your view, uh, and to be fair, one of many on leadership back in 2016. So have your experiences as a Chief Constable changed in any way that view that you held? No, I stand by that 100%, Dave. I think what I've learned since 2016 is, you know, it's definitely not an either or, right? So we want competency at every level and every organization wants competency first and foremost and it's not an either or that you're either competent and you can do all those other personal quality sides of leadership mm. or you don't know how to do the job you need both of them to build trust the one thing that i think i've reflected on particularly since leaving is that in my leadership journey some of the things that you need now in any organisation, never mind policing, but probably even more so in policing, there isn't the time and space to give you that training and that development to do. Unless you go out and do it yourself mm. and you're particularly interested and passionate about it and you're going to read and do the personal development work. The two things that I think everybody's struggling with now is do you understand technology and data? Because you talk about managing change. In today's world, if you don't understand technology and data mm. as an executive or a leader at any level, actually, then you're going to struggle to deliver change, manage change, and actually get the job done. The second one is what I'd call health leadership. The presence now in all organisations of workplace health as an issue and definitely a generational change of view and expectation of what the organisation's going to do to help me stay healthy rather than make me ill. Work doesn't need to kill you anymore. We've moved on from that. Then there's a de there's a totally different knowledge, skill and behavioural set around health leadership to get the best out of people. Mm. So I, I've moved from what is quite a high level rhetorical sort of, well, you, you know, your behaviours and your trust and that, to actually let's break it down and say exactly what is it that you need to do then as a mm. leader to learn and do at a personal level so that you can get your best out of your people. And I think we know that now, and I wasn't clear on what that was then. I've got more detail of it, and I should have been better and understood technology a lot better to mm. be a chief constable and have the lack of knowledge I had about technology and data was unforgivable in hindsight, and it caused huge organisational problems, in my view, yeah. that I have to take responsibility for. You and I are at a same, similar age where, uh, and we don't realise it, but you know, you look back at the Industrial Revolution, what a massive change to society that made. You and I have lived through a, a digital revolution. Mm -hmm. There's no two ways about it. The people that are now coming into the police haven't lived through that. Mm -hmm. That's all they know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so their mindset and outlook is going to be different to ours. Yeah, and what we started to see, even in my time 
uh, in the force was that new recruits were coming in and they were the ones teaching their tutor constable <laughs> how to use technology. Yeah. The tutor constable wasn't particularly happy about this because, <laughs> you know, I'm meant to be telling you how to do the job and, uh, you know, type of thing. But then with the flip side of that, though, Dave, is the new recruit expects to have at home level of technology at work. I remember sitting down with, with a detective at Blackpool who was absolutely livid about the where we're click click and this is just not working and i th i said well how have you booked your last holiday you've been on a mm. trip to here then I've done it all on the internet you know booked it here booked there yeah. booked a bus trip from here to there i said right i said so what, what why can't you apply that same level of attention yeah. to this he said i would if it worked as well yeah. <laughs> as booking.com <laughs> he said it doesn't yeah. you know you're miles off you're not even near so i think that's that's the challenge that we've got to front up to. And policing is not being a particularly intelligent customer of what it wants. A lot of its big systems, they're there. You've got very little choice. Uh, and I think that's starting to change now because the imperative around how important these systems are, not just to keeping the public safe, but also what the staff are saying yes. and what they expect, you know, they're up in the ante all the time. Yeah. And quite rightly. Well, maybe we'll... Uh... We'll come back to the technology side of things a bit later on. But recently there has been a lot of attention by the media of police failings, both internally and with several high-profile investigations. And I suppose time stamping this interview, which it's certainly I'm not making any reference to the, to the current investigations that are ongoing in Lancashire. Just generally, how much has leadership, or perhaps a lack of it, played in these occurrences, do you think? I think there's a definite issue around spanner control you know and i think there's also a turnover of leadership so if you look at say for example on response mm. you know even though for example here we'd put two sergeants to 20 one to 10 one to eight you know quite often be on a training course covering custody you've got one sergeant covering 18 people mm. you've got sometimes response sergeants for example turn over two or three times in a year 18 months so you know the old form where you had smaller teams with a sergeant that hung around a long time i think that level of contact with people personal contact was damaged significantly during the austerity period i mean we shut a lot of police stations down you've got police officers turn out say from blackpool who are driving up to lancaster to patrol on their own all day and they don't see somebody until they come back in that never used to be the way. And you could say, oh, those are the good old days. You're swinging the lamp, Andy. Well, there's a reality of how close you can get to people to monitor the standards and the behaviour. That's not an excuse. It's a reality in terms of we're a very dynamic workforce. You go into jobs, you go in here, you go in there everywhere. You're not sat in an office, most people aren't anyway, where you can actually walk around people and chat to them every day and have a look at what they're mm. doing. You can't be in the work with people as much as you used to be able to be. Because when we saved money in our forces, the same in a lot of forces, we saved it by taking out supervision. We saved it by creating bigger areas of patrol with less police stations in. And that's never gone back to how it was. I think it's not an excuse because there's no excuse for some of the things that we're seeing at the moment. But I go back, Dave, to our early time in where we used to work. And there were some very serious misconduct cases right under our noses so even mm. me saying that about less supervision stuff it can and unfortunately it does happen from time well, to time these, there's some of these incidents that have been widely reported have gone back 20 odd yeah. years haven't they yeah that's right yeah um but i, I do and i wonder that sometimes dave you know the the sort of formality and the role of the immediate line manager and the leader whether or not you know we've created a situation where they either can't don't want to or feel concerned about challenging poor performance, poor standards. Do you think it's just another problem to deal with and they I, just simply I think don't have time of, to do that? I think a lot of them don't feel backed up. I think they think, you know, if I do this, I'm going to get a grievance, something mm. like that. Are you with me? And mm. this, it's quite well documented, some of this, in terms of why we see line managers not intervening in obvious stuff that they should intervene in. Human nature, I think, Dave, you know, you, if once that sort of thing starts to slide, then it becomes the norm. Well, I think it takes great examples and great role models, not just of leaders, but peers. So you will, you've got a leadership responsibility, even though you're not a leader around standards, because you're working alongside people. I think that the generation of people that we are recruiting, I personally think, have, they may, in, in some senses, their standards are for 
follow in terms of build up boots and whether they've got mm. a short back and size and all that stuff is is different. So the visible standard stuff or the more challenging, the more questioning. But the fact that they're more challenging, more questioning has got to be a good thing. Because mm. they're going to question and challenge other people's behaviour. You would you would expect. Yes. And I've certainly seen that. Yeah. You know, it's it's one of the things you get, you know, is it with all oh, these new recruits, they you know, they won't just be ordered to do stuff anymore. Well, you know, you do need to be ordered every now and again to go from A to B or stand on a scene. Normally you have to order somebody when they don't want to do it. Well, exactly, <laughs> yeah. But you, you shouldn't you can't order somebody to do the right thing when you're not looking. End of. I do think that from what I saw with new recruits coming over years and years and years, there's been a shift there in terms of their you know, their proclivity and confidence and just the way they are to ask mm. questions about everything, mm. which includes a colleague's behaviour. But again, there are cases coming forward for and again where there have been missed opportunities to challenge, even when things have been really visible mm. and, and evident, and, you know, like offences have been committed mm. by people. So I think those are those are not just going to be laid down to cultural issues. There's, there's basically failings there that we have to, mm. you know, we have to own up to. Okay, well, let's um, let's crack on and listen to the next clip. We've just done a piece of work in contact management. We've looked at 900 jobs and we'll come in a surprise to use a frontline officer, but the profile of those jobs is changing significantly mm. and it's more around complex needs, vulnerability rather than traditional crime. What we find is that when we look at what's stopping you achieving your purpose, 95% of it is not driven by you. 95% of it is driven by how inefficient the system is. Bureaucracy, handing over jobs from place to place, decision-making that's risk-averse. What you've got to be careful with, the well-being agenda, is this very point you've mentioned, right? It can't just be a rhetorical, we want to treat everybody better. Because actually, the nature of our work's designed is one of the most stressful things that most people will have to put up with. So I thought that was quite interesting what you said back then and uh, the bureaucracy of the system stopping officers getting on with the work uh, and we've mentioned the technology haven't we and, and I know the Met have recently taken on a system that Lancashire used and now they're experiencing the, the joys that we did. But going back to the bureaucracy of the system really and the institution, uh, are we getting better with it or are we still in the same place? First thing I'd say is I know a lot more about that issue. I'm I'm really pleased I said that then. <laughs> when I listen to it back, I know those 900 calls we had to physically listen to, mm. which took ages. Then what we did is we brought in voice analytics, which is all any organisation that works on voice demand, people ringing in, mm. been using it for 10 years. Right? You know, American Airlines don't listen to all the calls that they just pick up and put down. Mm. We only log in most police forces around 50% of calls that come in. So you've got to look 50% of all your demand, 1.2 million calls a year in Lancashire, you have to listen to them all to find out what it is. When you put voice analytics through it and put some of these new technology and data solutions through, you can potentially remove tens and thousands of pieces of non-value work. And that work is the one that, that, that trickles down into the workload of the mm. frontline person. It costs huge amounts of money, but the, the, the really damaging effect of it is they can't see the wood for the trees. You know, if you look at the data sphere, in, in the world, it's going up and up and up and up. There's so much data. If you're the frontline officer at three o'clock in the morning, you've got a safeguarding decision to make, you've stopped a car, there is literally seconds for you to get exactly the data information you need to make the right decision. You know full well that in the cold light of day, if you get that decision wrong, everybody can look at all the other bits of data for hours and hours and hours and go, Dave missed a bit. And that leads to people, this is the biggest risk we've got, either being risk averse and putting even more unnecessary data in the system or actually saying, I'm not going to stop the car. That is not what society wants mm. its frontline officers and staff to be doing, right? So I think that point I made, we can now prove with our annual survey, year on year, independently, 36,000 officers and staff, that what they call hindrance stressors, that stuff, is driving every negative indicator of well-being. From intention to quit, mm. to feeling like they've got organisational support, to uh, losing sleep, through to um, psychological detachment from work. So we've flagged it up in the National Wellbeing Service. We've raised it nationally and we have work streams running now to look at what technology and data solutions are out there that some forces are already using, but not everybody's using them. And we're going to get a 
big basket of these things together and then we're going to show everyone and say, right, the cumulative effect of you doing all these will significantly reduce that problem. And that is great for the public. It's far more efficient and it's a massive boost in terms of your stress levels at work. Nobody minds working hard, Dave, if it's work that's purposeful. What they don't want to do is sit around for hours waiting to get through the gateway to get a CPS decision. You know, you've talked about this a lot. It is just hours and hours of low value, non-productive time mm. that ultimately some people stop putting cases through the gateway. We seem to become a slave to the system where our end goal is the system and not the reason why it's there, I suppose, if that makes sense. You can see how it's happened, Dave, right? I think we have, because this is policing for you, intelligence is important. Intelligence is just data. We've not really ever stopped and gone, well, is it a means to an end or an end in itself? And we've just keep collecting it as if that's the objective. The top organisation of the world said, no, it's, you can't just keep collecting data. It will just, you, then you, your staff don't know what to pay attention to. And that's very dangerous. What you've got to be able to do is collect data and only provide to your people that which is essential for them to get the job done. Mm. And we are a long way off that in policing. I don't know about you, but, you know, if I had 30 jobs in my in-tray and I kept looking at them, would I be able to say, well, that's more serious than this one? You start to lose perspective of where the real risk is yeah. in your work. You know, I mean, when I look back now, um, the two things that kind of stick in my mind is, uh, A, why did we do things that way and why did I put up with doing things that mm, way, you mm. know? But I think it was, well, what's the point of saying anything because yeah. the system is so big and it's yeah, yeah, me. Yeah. And the other thing, when you mentioned like 30 jobs on the screen, yeah, uh, that's that's not untypical. To um, make sure there's an audit trail on the investigations, you'd spend at least as much time updating the investigations as you would actually investigating. Yeah, and, yeah. and again, that can't be right. No, no. And there's, there's something in here, though, Dave, isn't there, about how accountable the police are compared to other agencies in the mm. system. We are the most public and most accountable, aren't we? It boils down to the, the concern for welfare call that you, you have to do that should really be done by, you know, another organisation. It's ultimately whoever knocked on the door and didn't go in is the one who's going to get investigated. Nobody ever says, well, why did that person's mental health escalate to that level? What were the missed opportunities? I know they do, and those organisations have accountability mechanisms in place, but it doesn't seem to be in the court of public opinion any near, near as sharp as in the police. And that breeds this sort of like, I've got to cover my back with this stuff mindset all the time because we do make mistakes in the world that we work in. Some of them are honest mistakes that we don't mean to make. Some of them mm. are failings. So you've always got this feeling, and I had it when I was the chief, that you're only as good as your last day because something is going to happen. The amount of complexity and difficult stuff that we deal with that's not clear-cut because every human being that we deal with is unique and different. It's very difficult for a big organisation to apply systems and processes that meet those individual needs. You've got to rely on your individual frontline worker to make a call. And if those frontline workers don't feel supported and they're not trained and they're not experienced, they've not got the data to help them, then they're not going to make as good a call as they could do. Why are mistakes seen a bad thing in the police? Yes, if somebody dies, that's a bad mistake. But in no, I can't think of any other organisation where a mistake is an opportunity for a learning experience. But people, uh, and we come back to risk-averse decision-making then, yeah. people don't make a decision because they don't want to make a mistake no. because it's seen as a bad thing. It's uh, Yeah, and of course, we've got the whole fail fast, fail you know, and learn, which is true. It, you know, before we'd invented the light bulb, we failed 999 times, didn't you? Something mm. like that. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Well, there's one thing making 999 mistakes in your shed when you can invent something that nobody's heard of yet, compared to when you're not, you, yeah. like you say, you're doing sensitive stuff around safeguard. There's a great book that a real supporter of ours, Professor Carrie Cooper, wrote with a colleague. It's called The Apology Impulse. There's some light-hearted stuff in it because it talks about how big organisations get apologies wrong. 
Uh, you know what I mean? Because I think mm. at the heart of get, saying mistakes are a good thing is you've got to know what you want to apologise for. You've said, oh, we've got stuff that, you know, people die from make mistakes. Well, you've got to be really clear on what sort of mistakes we're going to apologise and learn from and what we're going to say, right, that's just not good enough. And I think big organisations, this is the point of the book, sometimes don't go through that process and say, well, that stuff is mistakes and we're going to learn from them. This stuff isn't mistakes, it's failings. And therefore, they get themselves into a mindset that we're not going to apologise for anything if we're not careful. I mean, it's right the police are held to high standards. But I sometimes wonder if they are unachievably high standards. Yeah, it's high stakes, isn't it? I think, you know, when you've got people's lives and victims, vulnerable people, I think my sort of feeling, rightly or wrongly, is that anything that goes wrong, you feel personally is a failure because... And, and you don't want to lose that sort of care about it. You don't want to become blasé about it either, do you? That, oh, well, you know, I made a mistake yesterday, so what? And I think that just comes with the nature of the job. There are things that you can do that we always need to do more of to make that frontline decision maker feel supported. They know they're accountable, but make them feel supported and give them the tool to do the job. You've got this ever-expanding remit that's all fluffy and vague and should we be there? whilst the core is starting to suffer. Going because, back to basics is this well, thing that keeps... Well, it's the core that we're here to do. Is yeah. You've only got so many people to do the job. Same in social care, stuff like this. If you keep growing and growing your remit, the bit that you really should be doing is going to end up getting chipped away at. You know, we talk about, I know those chief constables are now charging health authorities for the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. and we're saying the police shouldn't be doing this and shouldn't be doing that. Well, it's all very well, but unless those services that we are currently backfilling for get the funding we will always have to do it it's not really the money we need is it it's the time of the officer i think it's a shame if we have to do that and i understand why some people have had to do it i mean i was very vocal uh, as chief in terms of mental health services because we just couldn't get anywhere and we were having officers stay in bed watching people for days yeah it's crazy well you know if you've got a burglar break into your house you're not really going to accept an excuse that, oh, sorry, we've got mm. nobody because the bed watching them. The mental health patient doesn't want to wake up and see someone with a taser strapped to the chest hovering over the bed. So it's bad for everybody. I think if you start charging them for it, one of the risks is, I understand why people do one of the risks is that they go, oh, great, because they're probably not short of cash. Yeah, it still doesn't great. take the officer out of the hospital, though, Yeah, does the, it? this yeah. problem still remains. Yeah. They're not where they should be, out there fighting crime. And, and it's a big problem as well, isn't it? Because uh, the person that rings the police because... They're suicidal. In the past, they would have rang their mental health supporter and they would have been community mental health hospitals mm. within society that could pick these people. All that has gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, to say, like, oh, well, the police should just stop doing it, it's not as simple as that. It's, it's not as simple as that because, unfortunately, when all that system fails and it turns into crisis, it's like when the educational system fails and somebody ends up in a gang carrying a gun or a knife and the police have to deal with them. The police have the right to say, why did that system fail? Why did the whole fabric of that system fail that I am now pointing a gun at somebody hmm. when I shouldn't have had to do? And it's the same with mental health. We're passionate about this, that the safety nets aren't like they used to be. There's a risk to the public of that. There's a risk to the individuals, and it's causing blue light services who, at the end of the day, were a triple nine service as mm. well. If it escalates to that level, somebody's got to go. I'm conscious that time's getting on. This was my tin hat question <laughs> in 2016. <laughs> God. Um, so let me play this to you. Uh, those that know you and work with you will say that you have a well-used phrase, and are you with me? Mm. Well, are they with you? I think the staff engagement work that we've done that's been one of the toughest things I've done here has been quite unpopular with some leaders. I think some of them fundamentally don't believe in the benefits of staff engagement because they haven't looked at the evidence for it. Mm -hmm. But it is quite difficult because I have, a, I have another great saying actually that people, you judge yourself on your intentions but other people judge you on your behaviours. And so many times I've, I see great people I've got who are in leadership positions who are quite confused that people, they've, something they've done has created a perception. And they'll go, that's not me. That's not what perception I want to create. Right? But we have created it. Mm. 
I said in the introduction, didn't I, that I, I couldn't ask neutral questions or, or be benign, <laughs> and that was my tinat question. I thought, hmm, this will be interesting. Are they with you? Again, that was 2016. A lot of the people that you would have worked with have now retired or gone on to things new. In the end, did you get the people that you needed to be there for change? I think it's very hard, Dave, to sense check movement in that area. When you're in it, you're there every day, you tend to focus on the ones that probably aren't moving as fast. But every now and again, you'll get a snapshot of something you think that is significant. Yeah. It will come out of a survey or a research study. It will come out of an email from somebody who's never met you, who says, this is what's changed. There's two I remember in particular, but for time's sake, the DIs on the night rotor. I think it's one of the toughest jobs in policing. They yeah. go to everything. I think the next toughest job is one you did because I think you do everything from initial scene to family liaison through to court, mm. everything, don't you? Coroner's court. The DIs go to everything and they go every night, generally on their own. And I saw one as he was leaving for a cup of tea at the end of his 30 years. And I said, come on. I said, what's different now compared to when you were a DS, say, 10 years mm. ago? He said, it's none of your posters on the wall, boss. It's none of all mm. this stuff you talk about campaigning whatever we've been given permission to talk to each other about things that we didn't used to talk to each other about and four or five of us get together at green bank once a month and we have a cup of tea with each other and we just talk amongst ourselves and we share experiences we chat to each other it's very informal but it's peer-to-peer -peer. Mm. we trust each other we don't want to talk to occupation health about this we might do if it gets serious we yeah. might say to our colleague i think you need to go and speak to somebody that sort of thing you start think that takes some doing because that never was the case. I've been in PMs and stuff like this with detective supers. I'm talking a long time ago now, mm. who've thrown detectives out who couldn't cope with it and said, send me somebody who can cope, do exhibits. Yeah. And that type of behavior cultural change takes years and years and mm. years. But once it's there, they then replicate that with other people. Other people see them doing it. And all of a sudden, Dave, this big problem you've got about who's going to pay for all this starts to become a little bit more achievable because that's free. It's tea bags and it's human to human stuff, peer to peer. And the one thing I've learned over the years is that peer to peer stuff is phenomenally powerful. I think on that journey I was at at the time, we were in the thick of it in terms of some senior people who didn't get it. They didn't think that it was all right for staff to have an opinion and challenge them on their behaviours, or even just answer the staff engagement thing, saying, why have you bought this ridiculous IT system, Chief Constable? Mm. How very dare you, you know? Well, they're the ones I'm going to use it every day. And they care about getting the job done. I remember Pauline Clare, first ever female Chief yeah. Constable. She must have had a heck of a job on in terms of breaking down some of the cultural norms. It is not pleasant work, Dave. Mm. And that is why a lot of people don't do it. Sometimes there are people who are your friends who cease to become your friends because you've got to draw a line in the sand about how they are behaving when they've taken the decision to step up to the leadership level, get mm. paid for it, but they don't want what comes with it. I mean, we talked about the digital revolution, didn't we? I suppose the change is, is a kind of a cultural revolution. I talk about this with, with mental health, right? And it's happened everywhere inside to this. For once, cultures change faster than the transactional side. So there's no developed country in the world that's coping with the presentation of mental health in its society because the system isn't geared up mm. to cope for it. We've told people for years and years to talk. I have. I still do it now. Talk to us about your mental health. There is a school of thought saying, well, why are you doing that if there's no one there to listen? You've got to get that groundwork done at least at the same time. Yes. But there's a lagging effect. Right. Well, I don't want to dwell too much on the past now. So obviously in 2016, Oscar Kilo was... I suppose just a, a glint in your eye then. How are we doing with it now? Where are well, we at? One big thing that's different from 2016 is we were getting there then, is we're very clear now, Dave, on what things a police force need to do to create what I'd call a safe system of care for the people who work in what is, we all know, a pretty tough job. That's what Oscar Kilo does, right? It does not advocate. There's lots of things you can do that support people's mental health that we're very supportive of. Are you with me? You, you know, I know you're passionate mm. about the Curtis Palmer programme. We love the mixed economy side of stuff. But if you're a chief constable, you need to know these five or six things are non-negotiable. If you put those five or six things in it in the right way, and so what Oscar Kilo has done is define what those are, 
and provide free training courses, free resources, link it through to your HMIC mm. inspection, because they're going to be asking you to do these things, the police covenant, uh, but provide the right support for it as well. Are you with me? So we, we do a lot of work with forces. We don't just tell them where they're not very good at stuff. We say, and we've got this resource, these people, these training courses, these workshops, come along to it mm. and find out how to get better at it. We don't want to be another one of those people. There's plenty of them already in policing saying you're rubbish at stuff. Mm. If we say you're not very good at something, you can guarantee we've told you what it is you need to do and that we've got a resource to come and help you. And I think that's an ethos that we've got. We, we're very clear on what those core things are, Dave, and they're big, expensive. Some of it's clinical, trauma recovery. We've got the fleet of vans. So we've got 10, we've got another two vehicles coming We've got 160 well-being dogs. That's been a phenomenal like mm. network of peers that are getting thousands and thousands of contacts with people every week. There's not an organisation we can find anywhere that can park a van on a response car park that can give you a blood pressure check, a blood sugar check, a psychological screening report if you want one, give you financial well-being advice where you work. We have got 43 forces, 200,000 people, and we have got an amazing fleet manager and his team. 65% of the van deployments are for health checks. The others are to critical incidents, so they'll watch the news feed and they'll set off. If there's been, sadly, an officer seriously injured or even killed, they will set off, and if that force wants vans there as a presence. Mm. G7, COP26. Because people said to us, we don't just want, like, strategy and documents producing. Where's the impact? We've done health checks on car parks of a response officer who's been leaving the NIC to go to a job, his blood pressure was so high, he had to go to any. We've had others, psychological risk assessment, confidential area in the vehicle with somebody from occupational health who's a trained mm -hmm. trauma counsellor, suicide ideation in the last two weeks, and they're on the way to a job. Men are the worst, Dave, as we know, right? Yeah. They don't like to engage, but you put a cup of coffee, a donut on, near where they're working, and you will get more people into preventative stuff. We're very proud of all that, and we're pushing on because the next big stigma that we're wanting to impact upon is fatigue, sleep, and recovery. And we're very, very careful about how we do that, but it is a chronic issue for a lot of frontline people. It's really difficult, isn't it? I mean, with my breakdown, it was, I call it a perfect storm. It was work, it was bereavement, and there was some, some personal issues. What I did realise, and it's an, it's an old saying, it's very true, is that you can't get better in the place that made you ill. And thankfully for me, it came close to my retirement, but I realised then that I, I couldn't go back to work mm -hmm. um, because I'd be dealing with the very thing that tipped me. Yeah, yeah. And there's not a lot you can do about that, really, except remove that yeah. from your life. And it's difficult. It is, because you're in play. Uh, it, it, not the operational end you were dealing with, all the, the grisly stuff, but even at my level I was operating at, you know, when I was going through a divorce, I was a superintendent. If I was in work, people just, you're in work, you're here. Yeah. And what you find is, you know, and I found this, I bumped into somebody at Preston once and she was coming in her jeans and t-shirts. What, what are you doing today, proactive or something? She said, no, I'm off sick. I said, what's up with you? She said, I'm just exhausted. So you've gone sick because you're exhausted. Yeah, well, there's nothing else. This is the issue, right? Why didn't she? Why haven't we got a culture that says, I'm exhausted. I need to come back off shifts for a couple of weeks and I'll be back. Mm. Why she had to put it on a sick record? Mm. Being exhausted isn't a sickness day, yeah. is it? Well, but it's the only option left for some people because yeah. we're not where we need to be yet with that, which is fine. Yeah. What I'm saying is we need to get on that journey and we need to start lifting the lid off it, but having the right support around whilst we do it. When we last spoke, the new police station at Blackpool was being yes. just about, um, yeah. I think the foundations were being put in on the day we were having the, the, the podcast. And we talked, I said, oh, well being built into the building. And there was, yes, there's well being rooms and these breakout areas. Interesting, great idea. Yeah. And you talk about peer support, but there's also peer pressure. And I have witnessed it and I have absolutely bawled people out for saying it where, somebody goes to one of these well-being and i've heard the comment oh they're off to the crying room yeah yeah culture but, eats strategy for breakfast dave doesn't it but how can somebody when you've got that being yeah. said how can yeah. somebody then feel i need to just have five minutes I, and i'll tell you the other one i've changed my view on is open plan offices mm. i don't know about you 
Right, but you tell me or not, when you really... I get it now because I work from home and I work in the kitchen, basically, because my wife uses our spare room. So I'm taking Amazon deliveries, ASOS deliveries, yeah, yeah. all, you know, the, trying to get a Teams call done when the dishwasher's on us. <laughs> the thing is with it, if I'm on doing something on my computer and somebody walks in, I cannot stop focusing on my work. I'm like I'm locked into the work I'm doing. And I think to myself, I used to walk around open plan offices think he's great this as the chief constable because I can wander up to Dave and I'm not bothered what Dave's actually doing and go, all right, Dave, how's things, you know, and think he's going to be really grateful to <laughs> yeah. see me. And I'm thinking now because I'm working from home myself and I'm not in an office, the luxury of an office where there's a door that I can shut, the open plan idea for people who are doing pretty difficult, intense paperwork and stuff like that, particularly on a system that's probably driving them nuts. Yeah. Probably the worst thing I could have done as a chief constable was keep wandering around the places, distracting them. Well, there's all sorts of things, isn't there? I mean, yeah, open plan, you write on paper, it seems a great idea. Yeah, yeah. But it's a bit like being in a call centre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, there's times when I've had to ring somebody up and perhaps tell them that the rape investigation that we've been doing for the last nine months, CPS have decided there's insufficient yeah, yeah. evidence. And the guy next to me is telling a joke to somebody. And never laughing. Or have you seen... And, yeah. You know, and you could argue, well, Dave, you need to go somewhere quiet. Yeah, but... yeah. I'll tell you the number one thing with that nick, Dave. You know what it is. I mean, it's a great nick. Yeah, but you know wrong. what the number one thing is that every talks about, because if you've worked at the old Blackpool Centre at Bonnie Street, which yeah. I have since I started in the job, yeah. parking, everybody I spoke to said, it's great, yeah, because I can park. Yeah. 500 parking spaces. It's like an airport car park. I don't know where they all came from, but you, you'd be driving into Blackpool, I would, right, as a, as a PC, in my family car, thinking, where am I going to park it? You know, and people used to use, leave them in the downstairs garage to the handbrake off. And it was like one of those games. Yeah, it was. Move yeah. eight cars to get one out, <laughs> and you'd find your car stuffed into a sim concrete post, wouldn't you, yeah. when you came off early? I think this this is another a great example, though, Dave, the parking one of you might have spent all that money on a nick, painted it in the right colours, done the wellbeing rooms, but it is a basic, human, simple thing that's probably giving you the 80% hmm. stress reduction, which is, I know I can go to work at Park, my car, somewhere safe. After that, if the computer isn't working or the, the colours of the walls isn't right and the bacon butties are a bit cold, I'll live with that. Because the number one thing is I just want to get into work and not have to park my car down the back street and come there at 11 or 12 o'clock at night when I finish shift and find the person I've arrested sat on the bonnet of it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's not great, is it? I mean, that, that multi-story at Blackpool at two in the morning, if you were worked in contact management yes. and you were to walk... It's not good. This is why you have to do listen to people, Dave, because I say this to people. If you don't listen without judging people, you're going to spend millions of pounds wasting effort and money on things that you think are going to improve people's experience of work when actually it could be staring you in the face and it could be almost free. Brilliant. Thanks for your time today. Perhaps just finally, the police are in a pretty tight spot at the moment, I would say. Uh, not all of it that they're making some of it is where, where do we see the future of policing and it's difficult for us well certainly for me i'm out of it now but certainly from a well-being point of view big question dave i think and you know i speak to a lot of colleagues who are still serving and they'll say they've after recent events the last couple of years they have never felt public opinion turning towards them as badly as it is in terms of trust and confidence mm. And you can completely see why that is with the horrendous cases that we've seen. My take on it is that, and I know it's a bit of a cliche, the boss's head start going down, the line manager's head starts going down, the people on the front line look up and they start to give up hope. This is what you signed up for. It's tough, incredibly tough, and I have a huge amount of respect for people in my old profession, as you do. They have got to keep their heads up. They've got to realise, and they do, I think, people still value and trust the police in this country mm. in, in a very traditional sense of how the relationship with the police in this country and the public is because it's very different than it is in a lot of other countries right we are still very much a face-to-face -face organization with people we don't back off them and stop them in cars and make them put their hands on the roof and all this sort of stuff yeah we're still trying to hold on to those so most victorian principles of policing but there are certain things we've got to do to modernize ourselves so that some of these incidents that happened that should have been stopped 
can be spotted early and dealt with. And it's not all about blaming the first line manager for not spotting it. There are systems and technological solutions that are out there now that we could apply that would help us do that. And at the same time, improve service to the public and the way work gets done for our staff. But that's all I'm saying. Are you with me? It's not the whole solution no. because this is cultural and it's behavioural and it's a leadership issue. But I don't think that, you know, we are where we need to be yet in terms of adopting some of those really innovative solutions to get ourselves where other big organisations who also deal with a lot of vulnerable people and are in positions of trust try to put the checks and balances in. I spoke end of last year with an ex-BBC home correspondent so obviously was actively involved in social um, news and policing news. And, and I said, why do your lot always attacking the police? Mm. And he said, well, we're not always attacking the police. But and I said, well, you, you never report good news. He said, well, we expect you to do the yeah. good things. Yeah. And when you don't, that's what makes the news. Yeah. And, he, and he had a point. But I think the best way the police service can promote itself is that point of contact yeah, and we'll do job. with every job and, and, you go to. And, that, that's our ad, that's and, our advert. And do you know what, Dave? We were talking about it before this started, weren't we, in your kitchen. I see people on social media in the police feeding the beast. Nobody's reading some of these newspapers anymore, apart from my mum. It's a dying trade. Nobody cares. It's like yesterday's chip paper. People are intelligent enough to see for themselves when someone's just having a go because there's nothing else to report about. Forget what other people think about you at the moment and focus on coming to work every day and doing the best you can with what you've got at the time. And you will not go far wrong. But stop wanting everyone to love you because that is not how it is anymore. And it's nothing to do with you either. And it's nothing to do with you, right? You are a human, an individual doing your best, hopefully, every day. It's not the critic who counts, right? We know that great speech, yeah. don't you? Yeah. You're in the arena, yeah, and you're doing your bit. Yeah. And be proud of that. And stop worrying about opinion. There's a great saying, isn't it? You know, I only care about your opinion if I actually believe you're somebody whose opinion matters to me. Yes. These are yeah. these are people who don't even know. Anybody can chuck stuff out for clickbait. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we're there to be had, aren't we? Because we're dealing with the trickiest stuff the country's got to throw at us. I was speaking to a guy in the States about this very same issue, been in the, been in the law enforcement and the police for years. And he said, at what point did being liked take over from being trusted and respected? It's two very different things. Yes. And the world of like, 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 it's subjective, it's ebbs and flows, it's just, it's opinion, and it's a stream of consciousness half the time on yeah. social media. So sit back, take a deep breath. What are you doing every day to make a difference and do the best you can? Yeah. Despite all the things that get in the way of it, I have to yeah. say, yeah, as we've been discussing. Because you find, don't you, that the people that perhaps uh, soak up this news, this negative aspect, in all likelihood, probably had a bad experience of the police, whether because they've broken the law or because they didn't get the service that they should yeah. have got. But I honestly believe the vast majority of people do get a good service, and that's down to the that one-to-one -one relationship that the officer has with the person who's called the police. And the vast majority of people will be looking at these social media outlets and, and news and clickbait and go, well, actually, I had a really good experience with the police, and that'll be the end of it. So it's really yeah. important that we... Promote ourselves by yeah. our work, but not by words, by what we I do. think there's another angle to it as well, is that we have got to accept in this country that our public services require sufficient support to work effectively, and some of that is about resourcing. You know, not all of it, because as we said, there's a lot of waste in the system. So we've got to do our bit and say, we've taken all the waste out, all the waste out, and we can now say, look, we need. if you want us to do all these different things, from counter to antisocial behaviour to this, that, the other, to mental health jobs, there is a capacity issue. That is something that, you know, you've got, as we have to, as a country, have an honest conversation about. And it's the same in any other sector, NHS, whatever it might be. We either, we either want to stop pretending we've got something we haven't or front up to it, pay for it or don't pay for it mm. and accept the consequences. What we can't have is people expecting us to do things that we haven't got the capability and capacity to deliver. Because what's going to happen is this erosion of trust is just going to get worse and worse mm -hmm. because you're setting yourself up to fail. You know, that's a be debate beyond us, Dave, in terms of being able to influence it. It's, you know, it's a, a national thing. It's a societal issue. 
And um, I think it's something that you've got to also factor into all these other things about what life's like on the front line. Because as I said, back in 2016, the vast majority of people are coming to work just trying to do a decent job. Well, uh, uh, Andy Rose, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Uh, um, for your time today, um, people say to me, you said, oh, your retirement um, obviously suits you, looking really well. I would say you're looking quite well today. Um, and perhaps in uh, 10, 15 years' time, we meet up again perhaps on a bench at, oh, with, yeah. with blankets on our knees well, and we, right. and we yeah. couldn't and we'll be two moaning old men. Definitely. Cup of hot chocolate or a pint in the Queen's. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Thanks again. Cheers. Thanks, Dave. It's been a pleasure.